the lights and everybody in the room suggest that we are about to start. So thank you for coming back. Hopefully you enjoyed the lunch and all the discussions. And I'm really happy to have here Andre from RIVE NCC to talk about how they've seen IPv6 evolve in the region since the World IPv6 launch. So Andre, you can say a few more words about yourself okay. and the stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, my name is Andrzej Saletka. I work for RIPE NCC um, and I work for uh, learning and development department. So we are responsible for training courses and uh, e-learning and also our certified professional programs. But uh, this presentation is going to be about, um, about 10 years of IPv6, uh, how we and uh, uh, seen the IPv6 uh, growth over the last 10 years. So first of all, to make uh, things clear, because uh, that's like, uh, since I work in the training department, or uh, uh, we hear this very common, there are two different entities. One is called RIPE, and the other is called RIPE NCC. So RIPE is the open forum that is open for everyone. Uh, it has no membership, no legal entity, no voting. Uh, what it does, it develops uh, policies, uh, how internet resources should be managed in uh, the region uh, based on uh, rough con consensus. Uh, and uh, then there is this legal entity called RIPE NCC, which I work for, which is a membership-based association of uh, internet, uh, internet providers uh, in Europe and beyond. Uh, and uh, it implements the policies that are developed by the community. So if, uh, of course, if I say here we uh, uh, do something, usually what we as RIPE NCC do regarding IPv6 or IPv4 policies is what community asks us to do by this policy development process. Uh, so how this uh, internet resources uh, management actually works, it's a hierarchical system of address space distribution where on the top of the hierarchy there is IANA, uh, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, uh, which uh, holds the whole, uh, all, every single possible IP address, V4 or V6, and also other numbers, because all numbers that are used in the Internet are uh, allocated by them. And uh, these are uh, distributed into regional internet registry. RIPE NCC is regional internet registry for this region. And there are uh, four others. Uh, so they are basically continent-sized registries. And then from regional internet registries, we have local internet registries, which are, uh, which are responsible on uh, further distributing the address resources to end users, either directly to end users or via even other parties like internet service providers, these are optional. So, uh, and then there are the end users who actually got the IP, IP addresses that they need for their, uh, for their devices. So, uh, even though this talk is about IPv6 in um, uh, uh, perspective, I cannot uh, talk about IPv6 without talking about IPv4 in the RIPE NCC region because actually IPv4 is unfortunately still what is uh, mm, presenting the most of our workload like our regarding the registry mm, because as IPv4 became scarce resource, uh, there are much more transfers, uh, conflicts and disputes and all those things. So let's just look and, uh, uh, briefly on the uh, timeline how it used to be and how how it is now. So back then, uh, when we had more than slash eight uh, in pool, so more than 16 million IPv, uh, IPv4 address, uh, addresses, uh, we, d we had this needs-based approach. Basically, uh, we allocated IPv4 resources uh, depending on uh, depending on how big a need that particular member or LIR had in um, uh, yeah, but that was always complicated because uh, it's like not uh, a hard topic how you d how you decide whether this need is uh, reasonable or not. It's reasonable for one, maybe not that reasonable for others. 
And then, of course, with uh, IPv4 addresses becoming scarce and scarce, it was really hard to, uh, to uh, uh, keep this system working. So we are very happy that the RIPE community uh, adopted this uh, so-called last slash a policy, which came into the action when we just reached the last slash eight of our supply of v4 addresses. It happened on 14 September 2012. And since then, there is this uh, simple rule that every, every single LIR, every single local registry gets 1 slash 22, that means 1024 IP4 addresses, and no more, no less no matter how big their uh, demands are. Uh, and this was in order to uh, have this, uh, to have this uh, run out, let's say, controlled uh, falling down policy where even though it will be uh, worse for some people that will not get enough V4 addresses, it will still be at least uh, some people will be able to get some addressing. Unfortunately, the inevitable thing happened in 2019 when we reached the absolute zero. We had no address in the pool at all. Uh, and in that case, there was another policy. And this policy, first of all, enabled waiting list. So now there is waiting list for IPv4 addresses. And uh, after waiting long enough on the waiting list, uh, you, will get, you are eligible to get only slash 24, that is 256 addresses. That's the current situation. Uh, of course, why is there a waiting list? Because uh, IP address also get returned to the registry. But this is something that we cannot predict. So we cannot tell you how, uh, when the next allocation will happen. Uh, so this gets us to the current situation where we have uh, 1,000 LIRs waiting on the waiting list, and they are waiting uh, 10 plus mon more uh, months. So if you if you join the waiting list now, very likely you will wait more than a year to get your IPv4 allocation. We also publish this uh, graph on our website. So here you see on the left where we enabled the waiting list. We had actually a big closure of uh, some LIRs uh, in progress. So then there were lots of, uh, uh, there were a long time where the waiting list was empty. But uh, just like with some uh, disease statistics, there was this second wave of waiting list. And uh, this second wave is actually, as you see, growing uh, beyond, uh, beyond all the scopes. So uh, here you see the first is how many LIRs are in the queue. So you see it's more than 1,000, like 1,100. And the second is uh, how many days the first LIR has been waiting. And you see it's around 300 uh, days. And it's the first one in the queue. Uh, so it depends. Uh, uh, there are were some some places where some addresses were recovered and redistributed by, but uh, uh, but uh, it's still like the uh, demand on the queue is uh, much bigger. Uh, and then let's talk about IPv6. So IPv6, uh, the hierarchical distribution works exactly the same. We have allocations of slash twelve to uh, uh, regional internet registries. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have allocations to LIRs. They can be suballocations, and there are assignments. Usually, the rule is that end site uh, should get slash forty eight. Uh, for broadband, uh, the industry sort of tend to uh, go to for slash fifty six per end user, but it's not required by any policy, and it's completely not against policy to give uh, slash 48 to every end user and site. Um, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, we also see some ISPs doing even worse, which is like slash 64 per customer, which is really not, uh, not uh, scalable properly for proper IPv6 deployment. So. Then I just uh, show, uh, put into some milestones how IPv6 actually went. Uh, so we started in 1999 when we did the first allocations to LIRs of size slash 35. Back then, no one knew how it, pro how it should be, so we started rather slow. Uh, then in 2002, uh, we changed the allocation size to slash 32, and since then, uh, this is like the standard allocation size. That had been further, actually in 2009, 
this is still before World IP6 launch, we started doing provider independent assignments. That means that if you are end user and you want IP addresses that are uh, not uh, bound to your uh, to your uh, uh, ISP, you want to change ISP or, or do multi-homing, you can get provider independent assignment. And then, uh, uh, then even before uh, IPv6 launch, we did this change of allocation from slash 32 to slash 29. Mostly the motivation behind it was to enable 6RD uh, or easier deployment of 6RD where you need lots of bits for hiding IPv4 address into IPv6 address. And this is the case ever since. So right now, if you come to RIPENCC, you can choose whether you want your allocation of slash 29 or slash 32. Uh, what also happened in 2012 when the last slash 8 policy came into action is that uh, the last slash 8 policy required IPv6 allocation uh, in order to ask for IPv4 allocation. The idea was that we should somehow encourage people to switch into v6. Uh, well, it didn't really uh, work that way. Uh, then in 2015, there was a policy for transferring resources because we had also a policy for transferring v4, but not for v6. This was fixed in 2015. And also the same year, we dropped actually this requirement about having IPv6 in order to request for IPv4, in order to uh, limit the uh, number of IPv6 allocation just wasted that are just asked for no real reason, just because the policy requires it. And then the last thing that we did uh, happened in 2019, we actually ran out of our first allocation from IANA. So we ran out of 2A00 slash 12, and we had to ask for a new one. That's a not big deal. IANA has a lot and lot of free space. So it just seems that we are actually using it. I will show you how we are using it. So the reddish color is the actual, um, actually issued uh, allocations. And as you see, we are actually issuing allocations in some, in some grid. So there is always room for extending each allocation. And this reserved room is the, is the gray area. So we basically most of, the, most of the address space is used by reservation. So anybody can grow without needing to renumbering their network. And uh, then, we, then we ask for another, for another pool after, after we got uh, this one reasonably filled. And the last, uh, last slide I have is about BGP. And unfortunately, here you can see that this is not very satisfying, because even though the blue line shows how our address space allocated grows quite a lot, we don't see the same growth in the global BGP. So that still means because IPv6 is free and every LIR can just ask for IPv6 allocation and they don't have to do anything for it. Uh, we still see this that uh, that uh, very likely lots of people are just are just uh, uh, asking for allocation without uh, without uh, using it or maybe just uh, putting it aside for some future projects that are not happening. So you can see that. The good thing is that the red line is still growing up, so there are IPv6 prefixes appearing in the global routing table, but unfortunately, it, the pace is much slower than the pace how we issue new IPv6 allocations. That's everything from me, and I wonder if anybody has any questions, comments. I can throw this on you. You don't have to throw it on me, so I'm going to ask, who was the first uh, receiver of IPv6 allocation in 1999? <laughs> okay, do you have some better question? No, sorry. I <laughs> <coughs> and it was also a little bit unusual allocation, slash 35, that's not really on the nibble boundary either. I really, yeah, but slash 29 is also not on nibble uh, boundary. Yeah. Uh, it's like this, uh, yeah, we, uh, I, I, I really don't know who was the first. I'm pretty sure that, uh, you can rec recognize the old entities in uh, IPv6 address space by having prefix uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, because, because uh, as you saw right now, we are uh, giving out from 2A something something, 2A00 slash 12. And actually, we just opened a new one, which is adjacent to this one. So it's also 2A something. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas previously, those that got uh, IPv6 allocations before, 
uh, got uh, started 2001, so that's much nicer in my opinion. <laughs> uh, uh, IP, IP assistant, you can, you can find those early adopters by that, but whose was the first, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know if it was in uh, in Europe, but I remember Cisco. They have uh, 2001 420, so oh. it's like burned in my memory. Oh yeah, very <laughs> very like yeah. My previous employer, which was Czech Nren, Cessnet, has 2001 718. So yes, uh, also one of the early adopters. Usually the academics and Nren's are those that were early adopters of IPv6. Wonderful. Any questions for? There is a question. So. I'm really bad at throwing things, so. There you go, I managed to catch it. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, as a matter of interest, what is the benefit, or in, under what circumstances would you get a block of addresses, v4 addresses returned to RIPE NCC when I could put them on the auction market and get tens of thousands of dollars for them? That's really interesting questions. In, uh, indeed, uh, yes. Um, if you are free to, uh, if you are free to do something with your addresses, then you can probably sell it. But there are also forced closures. For instance, that's the thing. Yeah, with the IPv4 become scarce, uh, people are sti starting to trick the system. So we, as Ripe and CC, actually invest a lot of money into doing due diligence to trying to figure out whether the companies that are trying to g become member of RIPE NCC actually exist, sometimes they don't, whether they actually do what they claim and all those things. So if we find out that something fishy is happening, we just close that LIR and in that case they cannot sell their resources, they just go back to the pool. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, there's a question over there. Uh, maybe now you have to throw it because uh, yeah. <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> Hi, Tom Hill from BT. Really fun example, actually, of how something like this actually happened. Many years ago, people, uh, well, right, I, pre I presume, gave out n subnets that were longer than a slash 24 as pi space, pi space. Um, BT had one of these, which is very interesting. We had a slash 28 of pi space that was used not on the DFZ, but had to be unique. So it was all very well justified and et cetera, et cetera. And at some point, someone came along from Ripe and said, are you still using this? Because we can't see it in the DFZ, obviously. <laughs> um, it's fine. I mean, they're doing their due diligence. And, and we looked around and we looked at it and we went, eh, well, we've since bought that company that we were using it with, and I don't think we're using it. And so we sat down and figured out whether or not it was still in use. And I had a look at the, <clears throat> the allocations, and I noticed that out of the slash 24 that covered that, the only the only IPs that were assigned was the slash twenty eight that we had, so we gave it back because we couldn't we couldn't sell a slash twenty eight couldn't do anything with it on the DFZ, but someone somewhere I haven't looked recently has got a slash twenty four just because we paid attention and, and handed a slash twenty eight back. So there are some very strange, weird, old situations like that that do involve freeing up an entire block that's useful. So can happen. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, uh, this is actually a very, very nice uh, comment because uh, in IPv4, yeah, there are lots of legacy things. If you look carefully into the allocations, which all of are published uh, published on the ftp.ripe.net, so we can go and uh, crush the data, you will find a lot of very weird uh, uh, allocations and assignment that happened in the, in the past. Uh, two things to this comment. First is uh, the policy about IP4 explicitly does not guarantee routability. So you can end up with slash 28 and it's completely okay with the policy. That's how community wants it. And second is um, what we actually did in 2019 when we were running out uh, to the zero of IP4. We actually collected all this code. We call it address dust. So all ranges that are uh, longer than slash 24 in IP4, this address dust was collected and reserved for IXP pool because we have special pool for IXPs. And in IXP LANs, you have to have unique addressing, but they are not supposed to be announced in DFZ. So uh, using uh, short longer than slash 24 is completely okay for small IXPs. So that's, that's, uh, that, that's how, we, how we now treat this address dust, as it's called. Wonderful. Thank you. For those who are not familiar with the, uh, with the terminology IXP, it's Internet Exchange. Uh, well, thank you very much. On